now kind of famed $2 bill, Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the uh, issue of currency, the banks and the corporations will grow up around them, will deprive them of their property until children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, hey, you might be noticing that uh, the last couple of Fork Full of Noodles that you guys have watched have uh, some background laughter in it. And that's because they are recorded at the live virtual stand-up comedy shows called The Citizen Revolution. Each week at The Citizen Revolution, we talk about a different topic, a different sociopolitical or economic issue history, philosophy, that sort of stuff, and ideally we try to add jokes to it. Uh, and each week we also donate half of those ticket sales to a grassroots organization. For example, the episode that you're about to watch, we donated half of our uh, ticket sales to the Tidewater DSA uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, the Tidewater Democratic Socialists of America. So if you would like to be a part of one of these shows and support independent, socially conscious uh, stand-up comedy, uh, as well as a grassroots organization, then grab your tickets and come to one of these Citizen Revolution shows. They're going to be happening pretty much all throughout the year uh, in some capacity. They usually happen on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Tickets are only $5. Uh, if you want to give a little bit more, you totally can. Um, and if you don't get a ticket if you're, or if you're on financial hard times, uh, feel free to message me, and I'm very happy to give you a free ticket to come to these shows. Uh, so, so if you want to do that, check out the link in the description, grab a ticket, and come hang out at one of these shows. They're super, super fun, as you can hear. Uh, it adds uh, it adds a little bit of a little bit of a looser element to it. I know some of this stuff gets very scripted, some of this stuff gets very heavy, but uh, with an audience there, it's the closest thing to having a live performance. So once again, this is Citizen Revolution Shows, Friday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. I hope that you can join us. Uh, and if you want free tickets to these shows uh, all the time, um, along with a bunch of awesome uh, bonus content that no one else gets, you can become a sustaining member right on my website at krishmohan.com, or rather krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N dot com slash donate you can go there you can become a sustaining member directly on my website or on my patreon or via paypal uh, or Bandcamp. there's multiple different ways that you can become a sustaining member and get uh, free tickets to these shows to the citizen revolution shows you get unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content uh, you get early access to the full episodes of these fork full of noodles before anybody else gets to see them uh, and a bunch of other really cool stuff. Very little of, of my stuff is behind a paywall, but when it is behind a paywall, it's basically for, uh, you know, the sustaining members and things of that sort. So, and there's going to be some cool uh, stuff coming up uh, down the pipeline as well. Uh, so thanks for, for listening to these announcements and uh, let's dive into this week's episode. Uh, here's where I want to start. I want to start way back in the 1700s, right? There was a Scottish economist by the name of Adam Smith, and he wrote that wealth is power. And that's just as true today as it was back then, right? I mean, look at somebody like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, the man was buff as hell, and he could stop like a moving train with just the sheer strength of his muscles. And then, exactly, that's what a train sounds like. Uh, so, <laughs> but, and then, and then once he stopped the train, he would make his pecs dance for the people. <laughs> he wouldn't do exactly, like he would do better than what I'm doing, but, but you get the idea. But now he doesn't need to use 
his buffness for any of that sort of stuff, right? Because he has enough money to purchase that train company and then give that engineer a raise and then ensure that no train ever runs on that track ever again. So basically, he stopped a train and barely broke a sweat, but he still made his pecs dance for the people. That was nice. So wealth is power. So that's what Adam Smith wrote about. And right now in America, uh, we're not just facing like a vast income divide, right? We're also facing a major wealth divide. And in order to try to really understand this, we have to look at what income and wealth is. Now, income is the amount of money you make. And that's before taxes. It's before taxes, okay? Really, income ends up becoming like the amount you as a human worker are worth in monetary value on a yearly basis. It's nice. It's nice that they put a price on, on humanity there, you know? Now, in terms of capitalism, wealth includes the income, but it's also your assets, right? Which is like the stuff that you acquired and how they appreciate over time. And by appreciate, uh, I mean that the stuff is worth like way more than a worker's income over time. Just way more. It's kind of like, um, appreciation is kind of like an unopened Star Wars action figure. You know, like, you know how like when you first bought that action figure back in 1971, it was worth like $1, but now, in 2020, it's worth like $86 billion, you know? <laughs> right. And if there was a factory defect, it's worth $128 billion. <laughs> so true. Or, or uh, what, that amount, <laughs> what that amount is now known as is a half a Bezos. It's worth half a Bezos. That's what it means to appreciate in value, right? But I'd say that that toy wasn't appreciated at all, right? You left a Star Wars action figure in the box? <laughs> what the, what do you, what do you fuck? It's what do you, like, Luke never fought Vader? Found out that was his dad? Spoilers. Sorry, you haven't seen a 40-year-old movie. <laughs> right? Yoda never, Yoda never came back to, to teach Luke. You know, you didn't, you didn't create a new fantasy adventure that involved the return of Obi-Wan Kenobi as an evil force ghost, which is already better than the sequel trilogy ever could be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd say that you didn't appreciate <laughs> that Star Wars action figure at all. I, I really, how could you appreciate something when you didn't let it live? <clears throat> Now, we've come to this point in our society that the cost of living and food go up, but wages stay pretty stagnant. Not just that, but we don't value intellect or creativity or problem solving in our society, considering that when there are budget cuts, those are the things we cut first, right? It's like the educational equivalent of keeping toys in their original packaging. Don't let them go. <laughs> <laughs> basically we've appreciated our stuff way more <laughs> like we've over appreciated our things you know in this grand canyon of income divides we're living in a state where the worth of workers and the human consciousness is appreciated less than oh i don't know let's just say like a shiny rock or like a really big boat <laughs> <laughs> bullshit <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so because of this income divide there's 80 percent of americans are living paycheck to paycheck because worth and wealth for the average working class is directly connected to their income and it's basically so, so the work a day american right now is burdened with 75 percent of the debt in this country right from mortgages to car and student loans credit card debt and even debt to friends for bailing you out when you failed to be a drug mule because you were trying to pay off all of those other debts, <laughs> those debts are also overwhelming the American economy. And right now, if you take all of those debts together, the American populace cumulatively has 
$13.5 trillion in debt as of 2019. Now, in 2020, that amount has grown to $14 trillion uh, plus all of your firstborn children. It's really just going up. <laughs> you can have mine. <laughs> I, yeah, you're, get, you're ahead of the curve if you want. <laughs> mine too. Oh man, is everybody just going to give me their children? That's a very irresponsible move. <laughs> you can have my kid. <laughs> These are all very irresponsible moves. <laughs> Look, if, the, if that number of $13.5 trillion gave anybody a heart palpitation, that's not just the shock of the numeric value of the debt, but it's also the fact that unfettered capitalism is a health issue, right? Millennials are, are, are likely to die 40% sooner than Gen Xers because the wealth gap has put them in a position that they can't afford health care for themselves or their families. Meanwhile, Boomers just keep getting stronger and stronger, despite the fact that there is a virus that is unleashed upon the planet that is specifically meant to kill them. Makes no sense. Now, according to the VP of strategy at Blue Cross Blue Shield, Mark Toluto, millennials don't see physicians regularly because uh, not just of, because of the cost of, of health insurance, but the trust between the doctors and the healthcare providers. But come on, why would we trust a doctor who just wants to dope you up and get free swag bags from a healthcare provider that just bought them a new Porsche, right? As far as I see it, that is as much our Porsche as it is your Porsche, Doc, okay? Considering that it was the pre-existing conditions that fucking paid for the thing, you know? State of, the, our state of healthcare is so bad to unfettered capitalism that millennials have no choice now to go back to using leeches to cure their migraines. <laughs> <laughs> and spoiler alert, you guys, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's a bad idea. You're right. I don't think it would. <laughs> but here's the thing. We do it so we can like feel, you know, something. Now, according to the Center for Disease Control, 90% 90 uh, 90 of expenditures of the, uh, America's health care is on mental health or chronic conditions, which makes sense because uh, a health care for a profit system is driving us fucking crazy. Real. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so because work conditions are going, uh, because of the, these conditions are going untreated due to lack of affordability, they worsen and uh, a, a sick workforce leads to less efficiency or a stoppage of work altogether, right? At this point, even our illnesses want a general strike. <laughs> <laughs> this also proves that millennials aren't really lazy. We're, we're just too sickly to work. <laughs> Look, a, a very sick workforce can tax the healthcare system and create a lot of problems in the supply chain. Now, Mark Toluto of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield wants workers to work collectively with the insurance companies to help decline the rate of millennial health and uh, try to reduce the economic impacts. Now, work collectively kind of sounds like socialism, eh, doesn't it, right? Come on, Mark Toluto. If you're talking for Medi about Medicare for All, just say it. You, know? you just need to come out and say Medicare for All, stop tiptoeing around, and just ask us to the socialist dance already. You know, we'll say yes, probably. We'll do that weird middle school thing where we hold each other at the hips and are way too far apart from each other. You know, we'll do that. Just say Medicare for All. No, but in reality, this is just about making sure that the insurance companies don't have to cover the bill, right? They, they want us to give up things like food or shelter or water to ensure that the health insurance companies don't have to be burdened with the cost of the sick. But they fail to ask the question, why do we need to make this Sophie's choice regarding our basic needs? Even Social Security is part of this wealth gap, right? Most average Americans contribute 
about 12% of their annual income to Social Security. But if you make over a million dollars, you don't have to contribute to that system at all. And if the millionaires and billionaires did pay their fair share into the program, there would be an additional $1.4 trillion for Social Security. The way the system is set, is set up, uh, it creates a health crisis that investigative reporter Nomi Prince, who wrote this article, uh, says unbalances the mind and body. The top 1% have their, don't, don't really have their wealth connected to their income because their incomes are, are only a small part of their wealth. Their wealth is connected to and cushioned by these created financial institutions, uh, such as the Federal Reserve Bank, or as the cool kids call it, the Fed. And just in case anybody is wondering, uh, I am one of those cool kids, you guys. So, uh, yeah. I'm writing, yeah, I am writing a whole show about economics. Tell me what's cooler than that, you guys. <laughs> Fucking nothing, that's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty, pretty cool. Talked to upwards of 10 girls in high school, so. <laughs> <laughs> about economics? About economics. <laughs> only, four of, only four of them were scared of me for the rest of the year. So that's a pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good hit rate on that. <laughs> now, most of you have recently heard about the Fed because back in March of 2020, they pumped about $5 trillion into the banking industry uh, and not into the thing that actually makes the economy run, uh, which is people. It's the people. <laughs> <laughs> and most of us think that the Fed is part of the government itself, and they're both right and wrong. So, so let's look at what this thing is and how it was created. Right. So the first thing to note is that the Federal Reserve Bank is technically not a government institution, despite its name. Just like Captain Crunch isn't really a sea captain, despite his name. You know? What? Yeah, I do believe he's an what? admiral. Yeah, yeah, he's an admiral. <laughs> he's not actually a captain. Oh my God. Yeah, but they went with the alliteration. Yeah, they Just demoted lied. him for the alliteration. Yeah, it's very sad. It's a sad story. That's not what we're here to talk about, though. That's a different show. <laughs> 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 the Fed is actually a private corporation whose sole purpose is to create, sell, and control the flow of money in the United States. It's America's central bank. And one of the main functions of any central bank is to create money and loan it out to sustain the economy. And really, the founding fathers of the United States were 100% against the idea of a central bank for the United States of America. Famed $100 bill, Ben Franklin, uh, pictured here. Uh, that's what everybody knows it from, right? The president that's on the $100 bill? <laughs> what he said is, uh, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary from the clutches of money manipulators was the prime cause of the revolution. It's a big quote. Basically, once people saw the tool of money was being used to control and manipulate them, they pushed back to try to regain that control. Now, in the 1700s, the way they decided to do it was a violent revolution, right? And, and that was very possible because most of the people in the 1700s were way better at cardio than any millennial today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's mostly because most millennials today are dying both on the inside and on the outside. So, <laughs> <laughs> and look, this sort of stuff really isn't taught in schools, right? Because it's not sexy to think that bank tyranny and Excel spreadsheets caused the revolution. Revolutions are supposed to be cool, you guys. And banks are basically where, I don't know, you go to like look at charts and statistics nobody really understands, you know? 
get confused what about what a Roth IRA is and why you need them. Now, kind of famed $2 bill, Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the uh, issue of currency, the banks and the corporations will grow up around them, will deprive them of their property until children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Bam. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Basically, yeah. what ben, uh, Thomas Jefferson is pointing out there is, uh, is the fact that Bank, uh, the Federal Reserve, that the, one of the jobs of Federal Reserve is to loan out money, and they control the military because they control the military budgets. That means that that homey, kind of dopey-looking banker that you see making dad jokes in his office is just as bad as Dick Cheney. Yeah. Who, well, if anybody needs a reminder... <laughs> Has was, he shot his hunting buddies too? No, that, but that's what I'm saying. Is he's just as bad as a man <laughs> that shot his friend in the face and then made his friend <laughs> apologize to him. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's Dick <It's> Cheney. <laughs> famed, <laughs> famed sociopath Dick Cheney, you guys. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's how banks operate, right? Banks start pay for these wars and then they get mad at the countries that we bombed and they're just like, hey, look at all these all this money you made us spend, you jerks. Come on, get out of here. Making us bomb you and stuff, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so if the people that wrote the Declaration of Independence and came up with the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and how to have game when you still have syphilis, uh, Ben Franklin. <laughs> 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 if, if the founding fathers were against the idea of the centralized bank how the hell did it come into existence and then gain this much power well in the early 1900s uh, central banks had been abolished in america but big industry robber barons like your jp morgans the rockefellers the rothschilds and of the like they were all trying to control and pass legislation to re-centralize the banking industry so they'd have more control over it. In 1907, J.P. Morgan actually started a rumor that one of the most prominent banks in New York City was about to fail and then people just started losing their shit. J.P. Morgan, <laughs> publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by publishing rumors that a prominent bank in New York was insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would cause mass hysteria, which would affect other banks as well. Yeah. So, uh, President at the time, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, authorized Secretary of Treasury, George Court Leyu, to give J.P. Morgan $25 million to help out these New York banks and maintain faith in capitalism. Morgan instead helped his friends out and ensured the failure of certain banks. The banks that Morgan didn't bail out called in their loans and people had to sell property to pay those loans off. So in turn, a hot piece of gossip was able to take down the American economy. Now this gave uh, bank these bankers a huge leg up in passing this new legislation called the Federal Reserve Act, which was written in secret on an island off the coast of Georgia. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended were told they could only use their first names in addressing each other. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. Now, the only way that this could have been worse is if this bill had been written in the state of Florida. 
<laughs> Guys, a bill written in America's dong would very blatantly fuck over the American people. <laughs> I mean, really, think of how much worse the Fed could really have been had it been written a hundred miles further south. You know? <laughs> it's fucking terrible. <laughs> now, as you heard in the video, senator, uh, senators like uh, Nelson Aldrich, uh, who had connections with, uh, with bankers like J.P. Morgan, uh, who he would marry into J.P. Morgan's family a few years after he uh, pushed for this legislation to be passed, and there was massive opposition in Congress to this bill. Finally, during the election of 1912, Democrat Woodrow Wilson was financed by these bankers and he vowed to pass the Federal Reserve Act. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. So, along with the Federal Reserve Act, Woodrow Wilson also passed the Espionage Act, which essentially criminalized military criticism, which put socialist presidential candidate Eugene Debs in prison, and consequently is responsible for the illegal imprisonment of Julian Assange today. It's also the predecessor of the Patriot Act. And I think unequivocally, we all here can agree that Woodrow Wilson is officially the Florida of presidents. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that guy is the dong of all presidents in America. <laughs> That's what he is. <laughs> now, the way the Fed finally secured all of its power was after it caused the crash of 1929. In 1933, the Fed seized all of the gold and abolished the gold standard, which made the printed money legal tender with nothing to back it except the word of the Fed. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve bankers decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the Treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill from before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. If you look at a dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives our money value is how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value. So, after the Federal Reserve Act was... Basically, this means that uh, our money is, is fake. It's, uh, it's religion in this country. That's really what this means. It's not backed by anything. It's backed by absolutely nothing. I think I goofed up on leaving that up for a second. So this is essentially like the first cash for gold scheme, right? That's basically <laughs> what the Fed really did. But this makes American currency completely faith-based. It is, it is a religion in this country, right? Thanks to, the, thanks to the Fed, we have a centralized bank a centralized currency, and a centralized God, and that is the dollar bill. Honestly, at this point, I don't even know why we have churches in this country, right? Like, every day, evangelicals should just go to a bank and hold a mass inside there, right? Your tellers are your priests. <laughs> it just makes more sense. <laughs> but, you know, look, we're in the age of the quarantine. I get it. You know, we're in the age of the quarantine, so we should be responsible and we should hold masks in front of an ATM while wearing masks. Everybody should be <laughs> wearing masks. It'd be in a drive-thru so you could be in your car too. There you go. Look at that. Yes. 
drive through religiosity. I love it. <laughs> now, just as a reminder, the Fed came into existence because of banker gossip, a clubhouse with no girls allowed in Georgia, <laughs> voting on Christmas, and the ownership of Woodrow Wilson. In 20 years, the Fed cheated its way to ensure its power to make, distribute, and loan money for the entirety of America. In 20 years, the Fed amassed so much power by controlling the wealth in America that it essentially became a god. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please give it a like. Please give it a share. Get the word out about these things. Content like this often gets suppressed. Uh, it doesn't really get shown to as many people as it possibly could because it's not content that YouTube finds or Facebook finds particularly friendly to the algorithm. So I depend on you guys hitting that like button and hitting that share button. And make sure that you're subscribed to get more videos like this. I put up videos on this channel pretty consistently. Uh, there are at least... Uh, three to six videos that go up on this channel every single week, maybe more. Sometimes I get the chance to do more. Sometimes it's a little bit less. Uh, but videos like this, videos like The Fork Full of Noodles, videos like The Dispatch, which are more uh, current events and news-based rather than big idea-based. Uh, we do some ranty stuff over some news stories that might have slipped through the cracks that corporate mainstream media isn't talking about. And, of course, stand-up comedy clips. Uh, that I will be posting uh, infrequently throughout the year since I'm not particularly doing live stand-up right now because of the uh, because of the current pandemic situation we're in. Uh, but that's why we've pivoted to the online mode. So uh, like I mentioned at the top of the show, these are part of the Citizen Revolution live stand-up comedy shows. And if you would like to be a part of the audience in a future Citizen Revolution live stand-up comedy show, grab your tickets right now. The link is in the description or you can grab it directly off of my website as well. I'm pretty much going to be doing these for the duration of the year. They happen on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Tickets are only $5. They're only $5. Uh, you can donate a little bit more if you would like. And we're going to be donating to, um, to, to amazing grassroots uh, organizations, activists, journalists, um, people that I think are very important right now that don't have any sort of corporate funding. They're funded much like myself by the people, by, by people that watch their things, by people that believe in what they're doing. Um, so if you want to be a part of that, you can uh, check out the links in the description or go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. While you're there, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make an additional donation, a, a one-time donation if you would like to, uh, directly from my website uh, by going to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N dot com, H-A-H-A dot com slash donate. I'm fucking up my own website, you guys. Um, but uh, sustaining members uh, get uh, a free ticket to all of the uh, live virtual stand-up comedy shows that I do. Uh, they get uh, additional unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material. Uh, they get um, early access to the, the comprehensive full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. And there's going to be a bunch of other cool stuff that I'm going to be trying to do, uh, particularly for the sustaining members as well. Um, maybe some Q&A sessions thing, uh, specifically for, for them and, and things of that sort. So uh, I'm working on those sort of things right now. Um, so, so becoming a sustaining member gets, gets you access to a bunch of different stuff. Um, it's it, between the Citizen Revolution shows and the um, sustaining memberships and the donations is pretty much how I'm going to be making my living uh, f going forward till we are out of this pandemic world. Uh, so if you want to be a part of that, if you want to support independent media and a, a grassroots organization, please do uh, consider becoming a sustaining member or grabbing a ticket to one of these shows. While you're on my website, you can also grab a copy of my brand new album, Politely Angry, uh, available on all of, the, all of the platforms that it would be available on, uh, from your iTunes to your Pandoras and your Google Plays and your Deezers and so on and so forth. Uh, the album talks a lot about 
um, uh, how religion and e economics are connected together, how religion and capitalism are connected together, uh, the, uh, the problem with uh, the prison industrial complex, and of course, I'm going to take down Jeff Bezos. I'm going to do a little takedown of Jeff Bezos because that guy fucking deserves it, right? So uh, if any of that sort of stuff interests you, please grab a copy of the album. Uh, it, it's also available on Bandcamp for $1 uh, so that no one gets priced out. Um, and I am also working on planning uh, to donate one half of um, the album sales to a grassroots venue uh, that I have worked with in the past. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys uh, consider uh, donating to that um, and purchasing an album and helping out. Uh, and I also have a merch store now with T-shirts and mugs and a bunch of other cool stuff uh, that's also available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys come and check out uh, more of these videos. There's a, a bunch more coming up. Uh, I post pretty frequently on this channel, so if you're new, uh, please make sure that you uh, have subscribed to get updates. Uh, and if you are a returning viewer, thank you. You're fucking awesome. Uh, but also please make sure that you are continue to be subscribed to this channel because uh, sometimes they unsubscribe people. So and with, with all that said, thank you so much. 